Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gracious God, once again we gather to learn, to grow in our faith, to deepen our relationship with you. Continue to draw us into the mystery that is your life, your love, your grace, your presence. Help us to know you through your word, and help us to be your voice in the world, so that more and more can come to know you and your promises, especially your promise of forgiveness and everlasting life in your Son. Bless us today, not only here, but in all of our efforts. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay. As always, I'd like to start with a quick summary of the last class. That is, and the last class, if you remember, was about St. Paul and the Pauline letters. We looked at the 12 letters between the Acts of the Apostles and the letter to the Hebrews. We talked about Paul's participation in those letters, with those letters. Some who actually wrote, people believe, some were inspired by them and perhaps written by people who were taught by them, maybe his like, disciples, if you will. Most were written to address a need, as we heard last week at the last presentation, because a community or uh, a certain group had lost focus, they had some other elements that had been introduced into their community, or in the case of Corinth, remember how they were so divided, Paul had to write them to kind of get them back on track. And many times he was very passionate about it, especially in his letter, to the Corinthians and the Galatians calling them, you know, you stupid Galatians. I love that. Who bewitched you? Trying to get them back on track. Paul is revealed then as a passionate defender of the faith who wants us, his children as he calls us, to know the true faith of Jesus Christ and thus to obtain what he calls the prize of everlasting life. Paul also wrote to fellow missionaries and leaders like Timothy and Titus and Philemon to encourage them. The early church thought so much of Paul's letters, of Pauline letters, that they included them in the canon of the sacred scripture. Which really, if you think about it, is an amazing thing. We had scripture, that is, they had the Old Testament, but they didn't call it that, it was scriptures, the Bible, basically. And they decided, the early church decided that these letters are so important that they need to be put side by side with the scriptures. It really is an amazing thing if you think about it. Okay, we ran out of time. Um, so this week we're going to talk about the letter to the Hebrews, the other Catholic letters, and then the book of Revelation. The letter to the Hebrews. It is a very unique book. You probably know this if you looked at it, if you read it. It's different from a lot of the other letters and many of the other books. It's very, it's highly theological, and it ties in a lot of the Old Testament themes, especially of the priesthood and sacrifice and prophecy. And it, it hopes to show, as we'll see, all of this is fulfilled perfectly in Jesus Christ. It is associated with St. Paul, and has always been, basically, or almost always, because it is most often connected with the Pauline works. It's always tucked in after those 12 letters that are ascribed to St. Paul in most, if not all, Greek manuscripts. You have the Pauline letters and the letter to the Hebrews. However, much is not known about this letter. Like the author, we don't know who wrote it. It doesn't purport to be written by Paul. The intended audience, we don't know, you know, it says to the Hebrews, that the Jewish Christians at the time in a certain place, we're not sure. And whether the book is actually a letter. Yeah, I think it begins with a letter, with a, the introduction, but it looks more like a treatise, you know, a teaching tool, perhaps to, to those who are newly baptized. I'm not sure. The main theme is the priesthood and sacrifice of Jesus, as I mentioned. It was written, apparently, we had to kind of surmise this, apparently, to strengthen the addressee's faith and fervor, like a lot of the other letters. Hence the author's writing that he wants to give words of encouragement. That's what he calls it in chapter 13, verse 22. He says, I give you these words of encouragement to strengthen your faith. 
And some scholars say that that's what they call the homily or sermon. They were words of encouragement. So perhaps the whole letter is not a letter, but a sermon or a homily, or maybe several stitched together. It's, it begins a little bit like the Gospel of John with a prologue. Remember, of course, the great prologue in John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. It starts with this exalted tone, the pre-existence of Jesus, the incarnation and his exaltation. It really gives a summary of the whole book and makes a lot of references to the Old Testament. So I want to read just the first four verses from the letter to the Hebrews. In times past, God spoke in partial and various ways to our ancestors through the prophets. In these last days, he spoke to us through a son, whom he made heir of all things, and through whom he created the universe, who is the refulgence of his glory, the very imprint of his being, and who sustains all things by his mighty word. When he had accomplished purification from sins, he took his seat at the right hand of the majesty on high, as far superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So like John, he starts out you know, with God, Jesus, the refulgence of God's glory, who came, was incarnated, through his passion and death brought salvation to all the world, and then took his seat on the throne of majesty. So it's very exalted, like John's gospel. It shows how salvation is ours, where, where it comes from, basically. Jesus is like us in all things but sin, and because of that, because he is the Son of God and divine, and Son, I'm sorry, the Son of God and truly human, he is the only one, the perfect one, who can offer the perfect sacrifice. He is higher than Moses even who, though faithful, was a servant of God. Jesus is, as he says again and again, a son, God's son. And because of that, he offered the perfect sacrifice and brought salvation, not just for himself, but for all of us, of course. It's very interesting, even though, it's, as I said, it starts out with this exalted tone, talks about how he is the refulgence of God, that takes his seat on the majesty, the throne of majesty, etc talks about his glory as a high priest. The author does talk a lot about Jesus as a human. He shared our human nature. There's a great verse that said, therefore he had to become like his brothers in every way, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest before God to expiate the sins of the people. Because he himself was tested through what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. The author makes it clear Yes, he's with God in glory, but he's one of us as well. That's precisely why he can offer a perfect sacrifice. It seems almost, and this is my own thought, an apologetic on Jesus' humanity, his suffering, and his death. It seems that in this letter and in other places, people really struggled with it, I think. That they, they, they didn't want to see Jesus as being like us in all things. It's easier to think of him as the one exalted on high, the one who never really became like us, and never had to undergo all the things that we did. But the author said, no, no, that's very important. You have to know he was like us in all things. He suffered. He truly died for our sins. Jesus' sacrifice fulfills and perfects all the Old Testament sacrifices, which, as he writes, had to be offered again and again and again. And as often as they were offered, the blood of goats and bulls could never take away sins. But Jesus' sacrifice is once and for all. Because he is not only the priest, he is the sacrifice. He is the altar of sacrifice. In his obedience to God, in his obedience and perfect sacrifice, God has given the whole world salvation. When was it written? It appears as though St. Clement of Rome, who wrote a letter to the Corinthians, not in the Bible, but written around the same time. St. Clement of Rome refers to the letter to the Hebrews in the year 96. So it was already written and pretty well known by 96. So it's before 96. And with all the talk about sacrifice and temple worship, 
in temple sacrifice. It seems that perhaps it was written even around the time or before the destruction of the temple, which happened in AD 70. So scholars dated from a little bit before that, that maybe in the 60s, late 60s, up until, for sure, by the, by the year 96. We're not sure, like a lot of these, we're not sure. I like the, um, especially the verse 11, in chapter 11, verse 1. Um, it's, it's always confused me. I think I've known as I've read that verse, and I'll read it in a minute, uh, I think I've always known that there's something huge there in 11 and 1, that it really is, is a key to our understanding of faith and how we are saved. And then I was reading recently from um, O Benedict XVI's book, Jesus of Nazareth, and he takes it on and spends about a chapter on this one verse. Now he gets into the whole the Greek and the translations and, and what, what, it, what it all means word for word, but I really like it. If you ever want to know, you know, if you ever want to delve deeper into this verse and salvation in Jesus, read O Benedict's book, Jesus of Nazareth. But this is the verse, 11 1. Faith is the realization of what is hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the realization of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Again, as I heard this growing up, I thought there's probably something I really need to unpack that. And only because I read that in Pope's book and because I've spent some time on it, beginning, just beginning to understand it. It says that, you start backwards. What do we hope for? What's the ultimate thing that we hope for? Heaven, of course. And so our faith, our expectation of heaven, not just a wish, a desire, it's an expectation. Our expectation that we will be in heaven actually draws us to realizing it, to being in heaven one day. It is the realization of that which is hoped for. So again, I said I'm only beginning to understand it, but it, it, it's, it's starting to make sense to me that Having faith, having that expectation, that hope of heaven, is actually what is helping to lead us all there. And the author says, for instance, look at the Old Testament, look at some of our heroes, Abraham and Sarah and Noah. Well, first, Abraham and Sarah, they were told that their descendants would be as numerous as the stars of the sky, remember, or the sand on the shore of the sea. Well, they had Isaac, basically. That's what they were looking at. They were like, really? So, from this one, you know, he gave us one. I thought it was going to be from the stars, I mean, as many as the stars in heaven. But they believed that God would, God's word would be fulfilled. And so they cooperated in their time with God's plan. They didn't see what we've seen, what we're seeing today, that we are the descendants of Abraham, as numerous as the stars in the sky, the sand and the shore. It's happening. But because they had faith, it's being realized. So you see, because we have faith, we don't see what's going to happen yet, but we can, as he says, salute it from afar, and it's our faith which actually helps to bring it up. I'm confusing myself, but nonetheless, there's, that's a very important verse, and I urge you to, if you want, you know, even just look at that chapter in the Pope's book. Okay. Um, faith urges us on toward the realization of what is hoped for. Stay firm, persevere, stay on track. That's, that's what we get from the letter to the Hebrews. And much more, but that's a quick summary. Okay, on to the Catholic letters. And the Catholic letters are so called because Catholic means universal. They're not titled, you know, to the Corinthians, to the church in Galatia, etc. They're just the letter of St. Peter, the letter of St. John, the Jew. There are seven of these letters, after the letter to the Hebrews. Three are ascribed to John, two to Peter, and then James and Jude. It, they also, as I said, Catholic means universal, but also, this is a happy thing for us, they actually appeal to us as Catholics, I believe, who may be even more so than some of the others, because a lot of what we hold and believe today comes from these letters. So even though it's Catholic with a small c, I think it could be Catholic with a larger c as well. As you'll see when we get to James and Revelation especially, you'll see a lot of things that we believe that are very evident in these books. 
Like Pauline writings, they are arranged in descending order in our Bible, of length, um, pretty much, generally speaking. But the three Johns are all grouped together, and then Jude is always at the end. Okay. They were probably written during the time when the Gospels were written, and after, or written around that time and afterwards, for the most part. From the introduction to the Catholic letters, we read this in the New American Bible. With the exception of one Peter and one John, the ancient church showed reluctance to include the Catholic letters in the New Testament canon. Why? Because they doubted that they had been actually written by the apostolic persons whose names were attached to the letters. They doubted that for, you know, to Peter that Peter actually wrote Second Peter or John wrote the, the Johannine letters. And in the New Testament was seen, remember, as a deposit of the faith of the apostolic, of the apostles. And if they doubted that, they said, well, then maybe we shouldn't put in James or some of the others. However, it is clear that even though they were written later, they testified directly to the apostolic faith. So that's what led the early church fathers to include them in the Roman canon. I'm sorry, in the New Testament canon. But let's not, let's not dismiss or forget about the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit as well who guided our ancestors to include it. We believe that very much. It wasn't just a bunch of people saying, hmm, shouldn't we, shouldn't we, and debating. The Holy Spirit basically directed us to have these 27 books in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. By the 4th or 5th century, it's pretty clear that they are all acknowledged to be canonical by nearly all Christians, although some still debate whether or not some of them are, should be canonical. Okay, so the book of James is the first. Although two of the disciples um, or can be named James or can be termed James, the letter of James was most likely not written by either of them. Otherwise, he probably would have said, James, an apostle of the Lord, right? If he doesn't do it, that would have been perfect because that would have shown a lot of credibility and given a lot of credence to the letter. But he doesn't. He calls himself a slave of Christ Jesus. And that's pretty strong, but if he were an apostle, he would have said that. <clears throat> there is another James mentioned in the Gospels. The brother of the Lord, James and Judas and Jude and others, right, are mentioned as the brothers of the Lord. And remember, that word is Adelphos. It doesn't mean necessarily brothers and sisters as we think, but it means cousins, extended family. We as Catholics do not believe that Jesus had brothers or sisters. He was an only child. Otherwise, why would he have said on the cross, son, behold your mother? Why would he have given away their mother to a, a stranger, to John? Not a stranger, but someone outside the family. It just doesn't make sense. He was an only child. Of course, we believe that. But it does say that his brothers and sisters were with him and were present. Remember when they were asking about him in the, in the Gospels? Okay, I, but I digress. There isn't a James mentioned as one of the brothers of the Lord. <clears throat> and he was the leader of the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. Paul, it, Paul said that he is one of the pillars of the community in Galatians 2, verse 9. And also in the Acts of the Apostles, we see that James is a leader, a spokesperson of the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, this James was stoned to death in the year 62. <clears throat> the letter is addressed to the 12 tribes of the dispersion, the diaspora. Remember when the, the Jews in, in the Old Testament were, were exiled from the Holy Land. Remember, they were living in the diaspora. They were the tribes of the dispersion living in other places. Well, James addresses this letter to the 12 tribes of the diaspora, the dispersion, which is a possible reference to all of us Christians. We're all part of the diaspora, the dispersion, if you will. Our true home is in heaven, and we're not there yet. So perhaps it's just written to all Christians. Surprise, surprise, no one knows for sure when it was written. Some say before 70, others say around 95 to 100, even later on, inspired by James. Some say it's the most Jewish of all the letters, in that it contains a lot of references to Jewish wisdom that we read in Proverbs or Sirach. 
uh, leads some to say that it was really a, a Jewish letter, basically, that has been baptized by Christianity, but it seems to be pretty Christian through and through. Like many of the letters in the New Testament, James gives an exhortation to persevere, stay faithful, especially in the midst of trials, persecutions, and temptations. He says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, which seems to be kind of a, a cornerstone of the letter. It's not enough to say, I have faith and not practice it. And it sounds a lot like Jesus who said, those who hear my words and put them into practice are like those who build their house, houses on solid foundation, right? You can't just hear, you can't just um, be hearers only, you have to be doers, you have to put your faith into practice. And so there's a lot of discussion about this in James. It seems to be a contradiction of Paul's theology. Remember, Paul says, if you believe, then you are justified and you are saved especially in Romans, you know, if you confess with the Lord, confess that Jesus is Lord with your lips and believe in your heart, you have salvation. And now James is saying it's not good enough just to say you believe, you have to put it into practice. And this, of course, was huge during the time of the Reformation, when Martin Luther took one side, the Catholics said, here, look at James, so our works do save us. And Martin Luther would say, our works don't save us, only our faith. The answer is we believe now is both, of course. You hear, you believe, and that leads you to do good works. Many people think that perhaps James was written to counter a false notion of Paul's theology, that all you had to do was believe and you would be saved. I like that. I think that makes sense. That perhaps you know, later on after Paul's letters, people said, well, I believe, I'm saved, I'm fine. But James writes and says, it doesn't make sense. You need to put your faith into practice. In fact, he says, and this sounds rather harsh, what good is it, brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Chapter 2, verse 14. So he really takes that out. There's another really just a couple of other interesting things in the book of James. I love this book. It's just five chapters long, I believe. So it's really easy. Read it. I think it will feel you really enjoy it. And be challenged by it. But in chapter 4, verse 14, and a little bit before, James says, you know, it doesn't make sense to say, next year we're going to go to this town and make some money. Or next year I'm going to do this. He says, who knows how long you have. You should rather say, this is where the quote from 4, 15. If the Lord wills it, we shall live to do this or that. So today a lot of people still say, God willing. Or here in Texas, God willing, we drink on the rise or something like that. Um, but that's where that comes from. God willing. You should say God willing. In Spanish, we say, si Dios quiere. If God wills it. Or in um, a lot of the Muslims will say, inshallah, if Allah wills it. It comes right from here. James 2, James 4, 15. If the Lord's will, if the Lord wills it. That's what we should say. And then also, it's uh, very interesting, especially for us Catholics, chapter 5. 13 and 15, that's the sacrament of anointing of the sick. When I go to anoint people and celebrate this sacrament, I say, I read this word for word. It says, are there any who are sick among you? If so, then send for the priests of the church and let the priests pray over them, anointing them with oil, and the prayer of faith will save the sick persons. And if they have committed any sins, their sins will be forgiven. It comes right out of the book of James sacrament of the anointing of the sick. As well, there is a strong reference to the sacrament of reconciliation. It said, he says in 5.16, confess your sins to one another. Now we need to know that the sacrament of reconciliation as it exists today in our church was uh, a process and what we have only came about centuries later. But we can, I think, be sure and surmise that the church in Ireland which really came up with the sacraments we have now referenced James 5 16 confess your sins to one another so that we have this, this sacrament in our present form okay first letter of Peter is actually addressed to the five provinces in Asia Minor it's addressed mostly probably to Gentiles scripture scholars say because of what's contained in it 
But either way, it's pretty clear it's written to all who have been converted and feel that alienation which comes from conversion. It's an exhortation like in James and many of Paul's letters to be faithful, especially in the midst of persecution. When Peter takes on this question that must have arisen, you know, like, how do we know? We, don't, we haven't seen the Lord. The early apostles saw him and people around his time, but we haven't seen him. How do we know? And so when Peter answers that in the first chapter, verse 8 and 9, he writes, Although you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, yet you believe in him. You rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy as you attain the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. So basically he's saying, yes, you haven't seen him, it's true, but you still love him and you follow him. And therefore, back to that thing we found in Hebrews, you are attaining the goal of faith, the salvation of your soul. Another interesting thing in there, to me at least, is found in chapter 1, verse 16. He brings in that common refrain we hear again and again in the book of Leviticus. God says, be holy, for I am holy. It also, this letter also speaks to us about how we can be a good example in the world to both Christians and non-Christians alike. When was it written? Sorry to say, we don't know. Could be in the 60s or much later. That's all I get. Every time I, 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 I Google that and look it up in the Catholic Encyclopedia, it says, scholars are not that problem, so we don't know. Now the second letter of Peter. It's more of the same, basically. Be strong in the midst of persecution. Have hope in the future, etc. Like some of St. Paul's letters, second Peter seems to take on specific questions and issues that arose in the various Christian communities like dealing with those who deny the second coming and um, dealing with people who are just, just kind of bringing in this false element, false Christianity. It's interesting to see, and I hope you can see this too, that now as we get a little further away from the Christ event, if you will, the incarnation, the suffering, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, now the Christians are dealing with things like there's false teachers, are we really sure that what the Apostles said is going to happen? Um, things like that, they're starting to deal with these issues now. Oh, and now it seems that people are misinterpreting the Scriptures. In the earliest years, we see this in the Gospel of Mark, and Ephesians, and some of the other things written earlier, we see that the goal is to get the good news out as fast as possible. Well now, there's some doubts, there's some questions that are arising. We see that in some of Paul's letters, and in 2 Peter as well. Yes, the author says, it is delayed. He and he's not coming right away like we thought he was. But remember, with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and one year is like one day. In fact, a delay is proof, perhaps, that God has patience with us. He's not just delaying for delaying's sake. He's saying, get your act together, and then, he will come again, then the Lord will be over. This, there's a very interesting thing in 2 Peter that I found out, that he, the author actually refers to the letters of Paul, it says that, the letters of Paul and other scriptures. Wow, so he's putting Paul's letter on par with these other scriptures. I think that's the only time in the scriptures that they refer to Paul's letters, I bet, pretty neat. It opens with reference to the author as Simon Peter, although it's spelled kind of different, it looks like Simeon Peter. And we read in 3 1 that this is my second letter to you. All of these scholars will say may, might have been put in there to give us, to give credence and credibility to the letter by claiming that he's from Peter, that it's from Peter. Perhaps. We find a summary in chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, in two points. One, do not be led into error. And two, grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And a summary of the letter. Second, Peter was not easily accepted into the New Testament canon. Origen, a great Christian leader in the third century, declares that both 
1 and 2 Peter are to be accepted in the end in the third century. But in saying that, or in writing that, he also admits that some don't agree that 2 Peter should be in the canon. It could be the latest work in the New Testament. Some say it could even be dated 125, you know, generations after Jesus walked on earth. Why? Because it refers to the apostles as our ancestors who have died. Also, the fact that he cites Paul's letters as being on par with the scriptures shows that it's much later. And finally, it points out problems that cropped up only later on. He talks about scoffers or doubters that have infiltrated the community and problems with interpretations of scriptures, as I mentioned. So 2 Peter may be the latest written. Okay, now we're on to the letters ascribed to John, 1, 2, and 3 John. First, 1 John. It's similar in style and vocabulary to the fourth gospel, and hence, it was agreed that it comes from the same school of thought, if you will, if not from John himself. Some think that it was written as a companion to the gospel of John to help with its proper interpretation as it combats false ideas. And in my words, it brings things down to earth a little bit. Um, and let me just say something about this. In this community, in the, in the community to which these letters were addressed, in many of the communities, we see these false notions, and one of them seems to have been pretty prevalent at the time, um, that it, we call it Gnosticism. The Gnostics, that's G-N-O-S-T-I-C-S, the Gnostics believed that they were above everyone else. They had this superior, what they called, knowledge. They were more spiritual, like the angels on earth. And you know, so they didn't want to get into the incarnation, the suffering of Jesus, and even living the faith. You know, they, yeah, we're, we're, we, we're above that. We're above you. We have a more refined knowledge. Well, as we see, James and Paul and John especially wrote to combat these people. And you'll see it. I'll, see, I'll say something about that in a minute. But that's why a lot of people want to bring it down to earth. It almost seems like some Christians believe that, you know, it's all up here. And, oh, by the way, I'm up here too. And you are down there. These authors wrote to say, you know what? Come back down to earth. He says, as we will see, if anyone says, I know God, but hates his brother or sister, he's a liar. He has no knowledge of God at all. He is a liar. He's living in the darkness, in ignorance. It's not really a letter. It takes on, it's more like a treatise, you know, teaching this first letter of John. As I said, it takes on this false knowledge and talks about true knowledge. It begins by saying this, what we give to you is what we have seen with our eyes and touched and heard with our ears. This is not just an academic exercise. Um, this is not just something about the theological exercise of God. This is something we have seen and touched and heard that we pass on to you. Knowledge of God and love of brothers and sisters are inseparable. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Chapter 2, verse 4. 1 John is especially helpful in our understanding of Jesus as true God and true man. And it, later on, when that was formally and officially and finally defined in the councils of Nicaea and Constantinople in the fourth century, in the fourth century, no doubt they looked to the first letter of John for help in defining that our understanding that Jesus wasn't just pretending to be human or anything like that. Truly human, truly divine. The prologue is a little like John's Gospel. There's more emphasis on what word made flesh means. It's not just a concept. It really happened. We saw it, touched it. We heard Jesus with our own ears and eyes. Okay. Two passages in the first letter of John may serve as a summary of the letter and the intent of the author. Chapter 2, verse 6, as I already said to you, as I already gave to you, whoever claims to abide in him, no, I didn't say that, sorry. 2, 6 is this, whoever claims to abide in him, that is Jesus, but, ah, I'm sorry, I did. Whoever claims to abide in him ought to live as he lived. 
One cannot believe and hate at the same time. If you know God, you will know love, basically. And the other verse that helps to summarize it is 420. If anyone says, I love God, I love God, but hates his brother, he is a liar. For whoever does not love a brother he has seen, cannot love the God he has not seen. Love it. And also, finally, interesting in this first letter is right at the end, the author deals with sin, saying if someone sins, pray for them so that they can repent and be converted. But he talks, he says, now there are some sins that are deadly, deadly sins that cut one off. You can still pray for them, but God has to deal with them. We have to figure that out and be reconciled by God. But if there's other sins, he doesn't call them that, but we do venial sins, pray for them and they can find forgiveness. It's kind of interesting because we Catholics have, you know, two, two categories of sin. Mortal sin, which cuts us off from the community and need to be um, forgiven through the sacrament of reconciliation. And venial sins, which through our prayers, through our actions, through the Eucharist, come on, bring us forgiveness. We, we can get forgiveness for those through those sins. So it's interesting. Mortal sin, deadly sin is found in first chapter. Second and third John. Both of these are just a few verses long. Perhaps scholars say it was determined by the length of a piece of papyrus. They, they just put, you know, they could only fit this much on them, so that's what they wrote for these two letters. They were both probably written around the end of the first century. Unlike 1 John, these were written as a reply to the problems within the church, to take on what they call deceivers or progressives in your community. Who are these people who are progressive? Remember, probably, maybe referring to the Gnostics who said, we're above you, we're ahead of you, the progressives. So it's taking on these people. Three John is addressed to a specific person, Gaius, but scholars say maybe that is another, this is just the name for the beloved, the all the people there. But basically wanted to, um, wanted the people there, or Gaius, to continue to welcome missionaries as they come into your community and be good to them. You see, when they went, the missionaries were sent out, they didn't want to go out and beg, because then people would say, well, they're just preaching to get money. They wanted the fellow Christians to fund their missionary activities so that they wouldn't impose upon any people and they could offer the gospel free of charge. So he's basically saying, thank you, you've done well in receiving missionaries. I'm going to ask you to continue to do that because more are coming your way as we try to reach more and more people. It's kind of what I do as a pastor. I thank people, I hope, for your great participation in this community and I'm on the lookout always to ask for more assistance you know, when it is needed to encourage people, all of us, to continue to support the church. I like this. Um, 3 John says, don't be like Diotrephes, or I hope I'm saying that right, I'm not sure, who loves to dominate and does not acknowledge us. Perhaps he was a presbyter in the church, and John wrote to him, trying to get him back in line, but Diotrephes would not listen to him. He says, I want to come and talk to him. Um, that would be interesting. I, didn't know, I don't know if he's going to come like Paul with a rod to talk to him. He says, um, I need to come and talk to Diotrephes. It shows, actually, for us, that even in the early church, they had problems with authority. The church wasn't as unified as we'd like to believe. It's just human. We're human, so there's always going to be problems. Lastly, we look at the letter of, of, of Jude. And again, it's not identified with the Judas mentioned as one of the apostles. But again, maybe it's the Jude mentioned in chapter 13 in Matthew's Gospel, or chapter 6 in Mark's Gospel as the brother of the Lord. There are some striking similarities to the second letter of Peter in the letter of Jude. In fact, there's some shared material. We've seen that before, right? We've seen that in the Synoptic Gospels. Matthew and Luke borrow wholesale from Mark and put that in their letters, in their Gospels. Perhaps Jude did the same and borrowed a lot of, or a good deal of um, Second Peter and put that in his. Apparently, they were not worried about plagiarism in those days, especially when it came to proclaiming the good news. Jude was probably written um, around year 80 or later, scholars will say. 
the author wanted to write more. He even says that. He says, I wanted to write you a treatise, a teaching on salvation, but I had to write this short epistle quickly to warn believers against false teachers <coughs> whom the author called godless people and intruders in your community. Again, we see a lot of this in early years, making it clear that there were problems from within and from without. It leads rather nicely to our last book, the book of Revelation. Okay, here we go. The book of Revelation, also called the Revelation to John, or the Apocalypse, in Spanish, Apocalypse. Um, it is hardly, hardly as straightforward, if you will, as most of the other books. You can't read Revelation like you would read a gospel, or even like you would read Proverbs, or Job, or Genesis. It's, it's very different. It's more akin to Daniel in the Old Testament, or maybe Maccabees, or a book that's not in the Bible, uh, Enoch, something like that. You have to know that it's not meant to be read or heard like those other books are. It's very symbolic and hard to decipher. And because of that, everyone seems has their own interpretation or misinterpretation about what this book contains. It is a series of visions given to John. Which John? We're not sure we'll get into that in a minute. But again, it is not to be taken literally. And they knew it. The people of that day knew it. We see that a hard time with that today. So many people want to take it literally. But if we take it literally, just take one example. We see that Jesus is the Lamb. We know that. Was he literally a lamb who walked on four legs? We don't believe that. But the Lamb in, in the book of Revelation has seven horns and seven eyes. You know, that's kind of repulsive, actually, to imagine that that was Jesus with these horns all over and seven eyes, maybe this way or I'm not sure that way or whatever. You know, is that what we believe Jesus was? No, he was a human being, a man like us in all things but sin. But the vision showed Jesus as a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes. Now the people of that day didn't say, oh, that's not the Jesus I've heard about. They said, no, that makes sense because a horn is power. And seven, as we'll see, is a sign of universality and perfection. Oh, that makes sense. The Lamb had total universal power and perfect power. And I, and I was a sign of knowledge for the people of that day. Seven eyes. Oh, that makes sense. He is perfectly knowledgeable, all powerful, all knowledgeable. So that makes sense. But today, you know, there's still some people who say, yeah, one day we're going to see this lamb with seven horns and seven eyes. Really? No, no. It describes Jesus. Um, and there's a lot of symbolism, and this throws a lot of people off. In things like garments, the color of what people are wearing. Remember the white robed army? The martyrs washing their robes in the blood. A lot of symbolism in that. Different colors, the gems. You know, gold obviously is a symbol of wealth, but they also mention garnet, sapphire, rubies. They all had symbolism. And numbers. Numbers were very important and very symbolic. For instance, we know that four meant the world. So the four creatures, which we ascribe to the Gospels, that means all the world for worshiping the Lamb. Six was imperfect, imperfection, because it was one less than seven. Hence, 666, but we'll get to that. Seven is perfection and universality. Twelve represented Israel's tribes, the twelve tribes of Israel, and the twelve apostles. So really, probably, all believers. And the number 1,000 represented an enormous number, countless number. It didn't literally mean 1,000, it just meant enormous, even just immense. The language that is used in Revelation really puts people off, and probably a lot of you, if not all of us, because we don't understand it. Some people are scared of it. Some people say, I don't, I don't read it when I'm alone at home. I won't do that because it scares me. But it shouldn't. It is highly, it's very strong language, but it's used because our ancestors were dying. They were being massacred. They had the threat of being thrown to lions. Just think about that. Even that could fill you with dread. 
I mean, it's unspeakable some of the things that Nero and some of the other emperors did. Just one thing I had to mention, but it happened. Nero would take Christians and hang them up and light them on fire to use as torches around the city. I mean, horrible things. So the author, when writing this letter to give them comfort and hope, he couldn't just say, hang in there, our gentle lamb is coming, you know, or, or something like that. That's needed in the, in, the, in the Gospels. But here he had to say, you know, Satan is at war with the angels, and it, it's, it's like a, a war in heaven as well, and all the stars are being swept from the sky. That's what it felt like to them. So that's why the language is so strong, because the people were really undergoing turmoil. They needed something to speak to them. Okay, we need to remember that this was written during a horrible persecution, or persecutions. The introduction calls it resistance literature. I like that. Written to meet a crisis. So I want to read. Many years ago, when I studied Revelation for the first time, I, I read the introduction to the Revelation to John in the New American Bible, and all of a sudden it was like, ah. I mean, I don't understand it completely. I'm, no one ever will. But all of a sudden, I became not scared of it, but it's something that I love and that I've embraced primarily because of this paragraph, which is found in the introduction. The book of Revelation had its origin in a time of crisis, but it remains valid and meaningful for Christians of all time. In the face of apparently insufferable evil, either from within or without, all Christians are called to trust in Jesus' promise, Behold, I am with you always, until the end of the age. Those who remain steadfast in their faith and confidence in the risen Lord need have no fear. Suffering, persecution, even death by martyrdom, though remaining impenetrable mysteries of evil, do not comprise an absurd dead end. No matter what adversity or sacrifices Christians may endure, they will in the end triumph over Satan and his forces because of their fidelity to Christ the victor. And on this line especially, this is the enduring message of the book. It is a message of hope and consolation and challenge for all who dare to believe. Have you ever heard that before? You don't hear that very often. Many people use Revelation to frighten people and to say, this is the red dragon. The whore of Babylon is the Catholic Church, you know, or Rome or something like that. Really? It is a message of hope given to console us, given to challenge us to stay strong in our faith in the midst of persecutions. Christ is shown to be the sovereign Lord of all history, past, present, and future. Now back to the author, before I get to the other things. It speaks about John, and the revelation to John, who is exiled on the island of Patmos. Which is why some of the early church fathers say that the author is the same author as the fourth gospel, John. Other church fathers say it's not the same person. But it's clear, no matter, that it comes from that same school, the Johannine School of Love, and that the author has a lot of authority and credibility. As you'll see, he writes seven churches. He's, he writes letters to the seven churches around. And Obviously, he had a lot of credibility, so someone very important within the early Christian community. Obviously, a close disciple of John, if not John himself. The date, it looks like because of the dating of a lot of the events in there, that it can be um, said to have been written for sure by the end of the reign of the horrible emperor Domitian, the ruthless emperor, as we'll see, um, which his, his reign ended in 96. So toward the end of that horrible reign, this book was written. The letters first there included in here are letters to seven churches, seem to be all located centrally in a circle from the Roman province of Asia. Um, and he wrote these letters to either encourage them, to say, you're doing well, keep it up, stay strong, or to chastise them. He writes one church and says, one community and says, I've only, I know there's only a few good believers in there. You really need to embrace the faith, you know, promote the faith. 
the cities were noted in here, not so much for their size or anything like that, or the size of the Christian population, but due to their importance um, as, you know, um, important trade cities or something like that. Okay. After the letters, there's a vision of God and heaven. And here is where a lot of people stumble, I believe. Here is where a lot of people take liberties to say, I know the answer, I know what all this prophesies. But as we'll see, a lot of it is not prophesying something in the future. It's telling us about what is already happening now in heaven, or what has happened when Christ came to earth, suffered, and died, and was raised. Okay. And then after, you know, I'll get back to that. Then we get a lot of the talk about the punishments and the plagues and the breaking open of the seven seals. Let's just, I just want to talk about a few of the things, a few of the things that kind of trip people up and scare people the most. The dragon, the beasts, and the antichrist. These are all about the power of evil and the war that goes on continually between evil and good, presented in sweeping cosmic terms. As I said, our ancestors were suffering horrible um, persecution and death and martyrdom. And so the author talks about that but says, at heart, same thing goes on in all of the universe. Satan is at war with the, good, the powers of good. But, hold on, good has won. Good wins and good will always win because Jesus Christ is victorious. Not was victorious, he is victorious right now. The hearers would have understood a lot more about these, the, these references than we do today. For instance, it says that the first beast that rose up to try to destroy the earth had seven heads. And people knew probably that those seven heads represented the seven emperors. There were seven emperors at that time, Nero and, and Domitian and, and five others. And they were merciless to the Christians, trying to root them out, as we said, blaming them for all ills, turning the rest of the world, it seems, or the, the world is at that point against them. So it talks about this beast with seven heads. They're, they're uttering blasphemous names. What would that be? Well, many, if not all, of the emperors demanded that they be called God. They be called God. Um, Domitian wanted to be called Mahana. He demanded that he was called our Lord and God, or Jupiter. So they had blasphemous names. The author says, the beast with seven heads uttered blasphemous names. It's not too hard to figure out. It's funny when I hear people say, oh, the beast is going to come up one day, you know, with seven heads. And I say, really? Because it's already happened in the first century. It's pretty clear. Um, the dragon, Satan, clearly, I don't think anyone disagrees with that. The dragon gave the beast power to persecute the church, as it says in 13, 5 through 7. There's another really neat historical reference there to one of the heads of the beast. It said the beast had seven heads. One head seems to have been mortally wounded, but came back to life. Historians will say that people of that day had this belief in a legend that Nero was going to die, but he was going to be raised again, and he would be worth it. I mean, he'd be even worse, the second coming of Nero. Well, so he says there's seven heads. One is mortally wounded, but came back to life. It addresses that legend. Also, Nero, how did he die? He mortally wounded his head. He slashed his neck, slashed his throat, and died. And there was some thought that perhaps Domitian, this horrible, ruthless emperor, was the second coming of Nero. So isn't that interesting? So here we go. I mean, it's, this is not just, he's not speculating about something in the future. He's talking about the events that the people would have understood in their day. Okay. <laughs> Christians had to either worship the emperors, and their images, or suffer martyrdom. This is interesting. Some today, oh, I see. The image, it talks about worshiping the image of the beast, the mark of the beast. What could that be? Well, I've heard all kinds of things. Maybe you have too. That maybe it's a credit card, you know, the mark of the beast, or this, this uh, UPC symbols that are found in, in foods, you know, or now those little square codes that you can scan your smartphone 
well, maybe that's the mark of the beast. We're all going to have it stamped on our forehead one day, and, you know, and all that. Oh, no. What was the mark of the beast? They knew that it was the mark of the seal of the emperor who was reigning at the time. They had, they had put them on public buildings. They were on all the coins, all the money. That was the mark of the beast. If you worship the mark of the beast, that is the emperor, you would, you, uh, you know, you apostatized, you left the faith. If you didn't, clearly you would be martyred, you would be killed. What about the, um, the number of the beast? He says in here, you can clearly, anyone with any wisdom can clearly identify the beast by the number 666. Wow, I've heard a lot of talk about this, and maybe you have too. What does that mean? Could it be... Hitler, you know, someone said, wait a minute, I remember this when I was young, Ronald Wilson Reagan, six, 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 six letters in each name, oh, maybe he was, maybe Barack Hussein Obama, wow, six, 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 maybe it was some Napoleon, maybe this or that, well, let's look at six, 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 you know, the letters of the Hebrew and the Greek alphabets had numerical values, so the first letter meant this number, second, seven, right? And if you added up people's names, there would be a numerical value. It's interesting to note that the name of Nero, Emperor Nero in Greek, adds up to 666. But hold on, there's more. It sounds like a commercial. Hold on, there's more. The Hebrew equivalent of Nero's name is 616. And isn't it interesting that some manuscripts of Revelation say, Behold the mark of the beast, 616. So it's very interesting, you know, I, I know that people are, you know, on the lookout for what that could mean and all that. And some people are scared of the number six. You know, just last week I heard the story about someone in the United States, uh, they, 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 their company, his company wanted them to wear, and all people to wear a, a button that said, we've gone 666 days without an accident, and he refused and lost his job because he said that's the mark of the beast. Now I understand that, that's, I don't know if I would want to walk around with that number on my chest, but nonetheless, it's not something we have to be afraid of, it's not going to be stamped in our heads or whatever. This was referring to Nero, clearly what people, this, people knew him to be, um, one, of the, one of the beasts, uh, one of the horrible people persecuting the church at the time. I've got to go, I don't have much time. Okay, chapter 14 then gives us this wonderful image of heaven. It talks about 144,000 people being saved. Wait, there's a number. Okay, again, there are some people saying, and some followers of Jesus saying, only 144,000 people are in heaven, because it says so. Hmm, let's see, where are we going with that? Well, if 12 is, you know, the apostles of the tribes, meaning all believers, swear that, you get 144, that's, that's, that definitely encompasses everyone. But just to be sure, let's multiply that times a thousand, a number that we can't even count. 144,000. Clearly indicating that it's an un, uh, uh, unbelievable amount, an immense number, a throng. You can't even count them. But because it says 144,000, a lot of people think, oh, that's clear, it's only 144,000. I <laughs> um, Probably not. And then it talks about the devil having this reign in a thousand years. That's another thing people love to talk about. You know, when is that coming? What is that going to look like? That was very prominent in um, a popular series of books I won't mention, you know, just a decade ago. What about this thousand year reign? What's it going to be like without Christ? Hello, one thousand doesn't mean literally. That, uh, if you know this by now, a thousand years, it's an unknown amount of time. We are in that thousand year reign right now. The time between the ascension and the second coming. This is a time when we have, we who are Christians have been, we are victorious over death, but we still await the full coming, the full fulfillment of the kingdom of heaven. Okay, the book ends with an epilogue that reminds the hearers and the readers of the themes introduced at the beginning. Stay firm, hold fast, do not commit apostasy and error. Behold, I am coming soon, it says at the end of the book. Now it's not John speaking, but God, but Jesus. Behold, I am coming soon. I bring with me recompense I will give to each according to his deeds. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And the Bible, 
this book and the whole Bible ends with Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Kind of. Then there's another verse that says, Grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ to you. I wish it could have ended on the other one, though. And I wish I could tell you, yeah, it ends with Amen. Wouldn't that have been nice? But nonetheless, it, uh, it says, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Some people start saying on the first Sunday of Advent coming up. Um, and also, the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So now, conclusion to all these, the, the classes, I just wanted to give an overview, just a simple um, a summary of all of the books of the Bible, from the Bible to Genesis, so that people are a little bit more comfortable with reading the Bible. So many people feel that it's beyond us, it's written for, you know, the experts, theologians, etc., but it's really written for you and for me and all of us.